boundaries are critical to our sense of well-being, but they're not real or fixed. They are at best a, a, a self-organizing structure that we use in a moment in time to give us some sense of order and stability, but they're always changing. And we're always sitting at the edge of anxiety. So, um, so I think boundaries that they are a scaffolding in which we self-organize our world around, but none of those are real. They are cognitive abstractions. There are judgment about how things work at this moment in time. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time, for a fresh podcast. Today we're talking with Laura Hamilton. Laura is a registered and chartered forensic psychologist and senior lecturer. She's been working in forensic practice for 20 years. She's specialised in the assessment and treatment of trauma and personality disorder with individuals who have convictions. She's a talented practitioner, often working at the cutting edge of clinical practice and seeking new ways of enhancing forensic interventions. She conducted the first trials of radically open dialectical behavioural therapy with forensic service users and was part of the development team which trailed cognitive analytic therapy. Laura is trained in a range of treatment modalities including CAT, dialectical behaviour therapy, RODBT, EMDR and sensory motor psychotherapy. As an academic she developed postgraduate courses for forensic psychologists in training and delivers specialist teaching supervision and workshops on a range of applied clinical forensic issues. Her research interests are in applied boundary studies, over control and trauma. Welcome Laura. Welcome. <laughs> it's really good to see you again Laura. I'm just actually listening to David uh, read out some of your many achievements made me think oh we're only focusing on one of these things today um, and we, I think we definitely need you to get you back on talking about some of the other stuff like radically open DBT for instance uh, but today you're here to talk about boundaries and I think if we could start Laura with you telling us about your journey how you came to be so interested in and knowledgeable about boundaries. Um, I, I think really it sort of started when uh, we were setting up the um, personality disorder service to be a personality disorder service at Rampton and when you sort of read the literature everything said that consistent boundary management was essential if you're going to assess and treat people with personality disorder and um, when I tried to understand what consistent boundary management was there wasn't really anything written about it um, except that you needed to do it and it was really important but actually what 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 that looked like um, I wasn't quite clear about it. Um, so as a ward psychologist in this new service and staff would be saying we're trying to get consistent boundary management what do we need to do Laura and I'm going like, I really don't know because uh, it's not articulated so I I, I end up um, is that's how I do approach problems in a sort of indirect way well I, I sort of thought that we're managing these patients really well, so therefore by default we must have consistent boundary management. So if I study what people are doing, then maybe I could have a model of consistent boundary management that then I could share with other people. So that's how I got into it way back in about 2004, was a practical need uh, to train staff up in consistent boundary management and to articulate this in some way. And it's probably worth us flagging up that for in services for people with um, histories of complex trauma, so services labelled for people with personality disordered boundaries is often a, a massive issue, isn't it? And it has led to the closure of some very high profile services. Yeah, and, and that, that idea of consistent boundary management, that came out of the Fallon inquiry into Ashworth, which was sort of very early services that were sort of working with people with personality disorder. Uh, and um, 
And then there was a whole range of other sort of services with people with personality disorder where there had been sort of major boundary issues. So everywhere you looked in the literature, consistent boundary management was the key to treating this client group and managing this client group, but no nowhere was articulated what that was. We just were meant to know by osmosis how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really good, really good observation. And given given the amount of attention that's been given to the boundary between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, do you think your personal history is relevant to your interest in boundaries? Um, not consciously, but um, the unconscious is always at work, isn't it? So probably, um, and I think if uh, it it doesn't surprise me that that I've spent a large part of my career talking about boundaries and obsessing about boundaries, and uh, before I became a psychologist and growing up in Northern Ireland, I suspect that there was a similar process of talking about boundaries or borders and uh, obsessing about them. And uh, and also just thinking during the troubles when I grew up, there was areas where you could go and where you couldn't go. And with that, then there's this idea of boundaries that are always present and one always needs to be mindful of them. But um, I'm not sure it was conscious how I ended up getting into boundaries and it really was a practical question that sent me down this journey it wasn't I ever had a deep burning desire to study boundaries um, but once I got into it then um, I became slightly obsessed I think. I think um, when you think about boundaries in the context of, of um, Ireland, Northern Ireland and the Southern Ireland boundaries does conjure up both images of safety and also danger, doesn't it? And that's very relevant to to forensic practice. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think there's something about... So I did get into the concept of geographic boundaries a bit later in my career when I uh, in the sort of philosophical paper that I recently published. And uh, this idea of borderlands, which is that you sort of... You don't belong to anywhere, but you're in the middle of two very defined places and I think when I started to read about that concept then that really connected to growing up in Northern Ireland in the sense that there was always this who who owned Northern Ireland and that was always around and there was always a a, a sort of borderland borderland and that you were sort of living in both countries you know you were in the island of I Ireland but you belonged in Northern Ireland to um, the UK and were under sort of a uh, London rule before we had a devolved government of sorts. So um, I think boundaries are always there. And I think it doesn't surprise me probably I end up in forensics because I'm quite comfortable with those types of environments. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it probably had some bearing, but I'm, who knows. Thank mm. you. Um, within your work on boundaries, you often discuss relational security. Mm. What do, you, what do you mean by this? What is relational security and what's its purpose? I don't really like the term relational security. And I acquired it because um, it was a language that was familiar to people in hospitals. And nobody really wanted to talk to me about boundaries or relational boundaries um, or the therapeutic relationship. But it turns out people like to talk to me about relational security. So... Um, it was a way to start these types of conversations and um, and to get some investment of the organisation into, to, I prefer the term relational boundaries, um, start to get some investment into training staff and relational boundaries. And um, I remember when I was way back in like early 2000s and we were trying to introduce the sort of boundary seesaw model and, and boundary training for staff that... Uh, Relational security was a way to do that because I was able to show that we had, I don't know, for example, 120 policies on security and, uh, you know, say 30 of those were on physical security and, the you know, 89 were on um, procedural security and one procedure talked about the concept of relational security and the tilt review is quite clear that to have good security uh, it's an indivisible hole between physical, procedural and relational. So if you spend no time on relational security, then by default our security was undermined. And that was a really strong argument to get people interested in relational boundaries. So I used the sort of relational security language because it was familiar. 
but I actually don't think it's very well defined. Um, I know Tig and uh, uh, Verity Chester have done some work on this, but it's I think it's pretty defined because it's very it's impossible to define it because what is relational security for you or Dave or me would be very different because we it's very much a personal process about how you see relationships working and how you position yourself in terms of proximity to other people. Um, so there'll be some commonalities, but it is it's a dynamic process and it's even changeable for us. Yeah, what is- it's it's interesting that you you that isn't language that you like because I remember the first time I heard the phrase mm-hmm. relational security mm-hmm. and I, I for me there was like yes at last mm-hmm. a way to talk about mm-hmm. boundaries that people will take seriously mm-hmm. because it often seems in forensic environments as if people are obsessing about physical security mm-hmm. you know build an extra wall put an extra gate in um, even when there hasn't been any um any escape or attempt to escape but it's kind of like if people are anxious if we put another layer of something physical in place it will keep people safer mm. and actually I, I loved the phrase relational security when I heard it because I thought at last it helps people take seriously the fact that sometimes security is about things that are a little bit woollier or not tangible in quite the quite the same way so it's interesting we had a different reaction yeah to it. I mean I think it's I think the it's relational security is certainly a place to start conversations um, and I think it's been helpful in that idea of the security triad of physical procedural and relational you can see that there's the gap um, and when you talk about going out to hospital someone's going um, out because they've got a physical, physical injury to hospital you know it's a really good way of showing well all this two million pounds worth of security as soon as you go in that van and leave that disappears all this procedural security around alarms, etc., that disappears. All you have is you and that person. And the relational security sometimes is all you have in sometimes your more vulnerable, most vulnerable situations. So it creates a dialogue, but it doesn't really tell you what it is. And it's yeah. it's that nuanced relational boundary management that we do with each other, to me, it is the essence of our work together and whether that's about keeping a person safe, keeping the organisation safe, teams, helping somebody grow. Because I suppose the thing for me about relational security, it's, it's focused on safety, whereas relational boundaries is about safety and it's about growth. So boundaries are also places for development. <laughs> Do we talk enough about relational boundaries? I'm conscious of you saying that, you know, and I think you're right, that quite often institutions will have very many policies mm-hmm. around physical security and procedural security, but perhaps one on on relational security. Is there enough conversation about boundaries, do you think? I think it's improved dramatically, actually. If I think way back to early 2000s, I really had to fight to create a space for... Um, and, even, and that's in a context in which there was an acceptance that consistent boundary management was essential for good care of people with personality disorder. But I still had to fight to create that space. And to have a sophisticated conversation, not these sort of dramatic stories about how boundaries have gone wrong that scare the life out of everybody. But, you know, that sophisticated conversation about boundaries that we're constantly in negotiation around boundaries and that this is critical, just not for, you know, boundaries can be points of connection as well as points of separation. So having, you know, much more sophisticated conversations around boundaries and their role in all our lives. Um I don't really have to have that fight anymore. I think it's most organisations that are working with people with personality disorder, complex trauma, are talking about boundaries. And a lot a lot of organisations have adopted the boundary seesaw model because it shows that dynamic movement around boundaries and provides a, a non-pejorative way to think about boundaries because there, there was always a dialogue of good boundary holders and bad boundary holders, and actually it's, it's much more subtle than that, isn't it? Yeah, but you brought us very nicely to, I guess, the next question in terms of if you tell us a bit about your research into boundaries, how you conducted it and what you found. My original research, so I think I said earlier that this idea that um, if I wanted to understand what consistent boundary management was, the fact that we were managing very, very um, 
traumatized people uh, with quite s severe psychopathology um, that we were managing this group. So in some ways, consistent boundary management must have been happening. So taking a positive psychology perspective, let's look at what people are doing. And I was actually studying ethnography at the time. It was one of my sort of random, off I go into some random interest. So I was studying ethnography and uh, so I thought, oh, well, let me apply these principles of ethnography to this study of boundaries. So I took my insider perspective as the ward psychologist and just had dialogues with people around boundary issues. Um, so if there had been a clash of boundaries, I would I would hear the patient's perspective on, well, how did that, what was that like for you? What, how did you experience that? What do you think, you know, what did you want to do? What did you actually do? And then I would chat with the staff and say, well, why did you manage the boundaries in that way? And what was going on? And what were you thinking? And what was your, what was your outcome? What were you hoping for? So I did this sort of ethnographic study using my insider perspective of talking to a range of people involved in making boundary decisions every day. And also my own experiences of setting boundaries in those in, in that setting. And from that, then, I used a grounded theorising approach to pull together um, all these conversations. And I um, I was studying also at the time cognitive analytic therapy, and uh, one of the aspects of that <laughs> is that you do a contextual reformulation, which is a formulation of the organisation. So I had my grounded theorising in this ethnogra ethnographic study with hearing people's boundary narratives um, and sort of pulling those into roles that people took. And then I had my cognitive analytic therapy, which was this contextual reformulation, trying to capture my ward in terms of how it was relating relationally. Um, and I think really in some ways th those aspects of thinking combined um, in terms of how I finally read up the study, which was identifying these three roles that people tended to take, this sort of control or security guard, and that comes, that language was used by patients and, and, and staff. This sort of pacifier or super care um, was another role, and then this mediator, negotiator, and these were the sort of, these were labelled by um, patients and staff and uh, they sort of captured the three roles that people tended to take in holding boundaries. But it's not just a simple, you are a role. We're constantly moving in and out of those roles. But there was these clear th themes, people who were quite focused on control, being quite emotionally distant, and their sort of ideas about safety and healing was that that occurs through objectivity and providing the person feedback. And, you know, when someone pushes on the boundaries, then it's about holding firm, fixed boundaries, and if they're pushed, then strengthening them and tightening them. But what that often left people feeling was that you know, uh, that, that they weren't considered as an individual, as an authoritarian, feeling quite controlled, quite, they either had to just put up and shut up and suppress, but then you would get a bit of a pushback later. Or some of the more antisocial patients would say that you know, they would have pushed back to get power because they felt powerless. So they would do things to get power and then they would be in the controlling position. And the member of staff who liked to take that position uh, uh, where they were in control, they would feel vulnerable and then they would tighten the boundaries. And it would get, you get this vicious control loop where it would just get tighter and tighter and tighter to the point that there was, there was no mutual relation anymore. It was a series of rules and procedures. So that was one. That was one sort of rule that we identified, and I probably jumped ahead in terms of talking through some of this. But I can I can share some more if that's if that'd be helpful. Yeah. So so the other rule I was thinking about was the the, the pacifier rule, and and again we we find with that with that that um people who tended to get into that rule, their ideas about how care and healing and and safety happens is it it's an unconditional positive regard. So it's about working with the individual, their needs and responding in a very in-the-moment way to help that person through. Um, and they're sort of, they were often described as being quite placatory or over-advocating. People took this pacifier role. And it was interesting because you would assume that, that that would be nice to be, be getting things all the time. 
and you know this person will always do things for you or hold you in mind but what we found was that for some patients that that was just an intolerable place that they uh, um i think one i remember one member staff who tended to take this position quite a lot and uh one of the patients refused to have this person as their name nurse. And I remember having one of these boundary conversations. And he just, he said, Laura, I don't want to work with her. She's just chronically nice. Like it was a disorder to be nice. But for, but I remember Des McVeigh saying one time that, you know, that people's ability to accept is often related to their self-esteem. And actually, if somebody's constantly trying to give you stuff, whether it be time, attention, or what have you, that for some people that can actually feel quite threatening and quite dangerous because it jars against your your sense of what your what you deserve within a relationship. A hundred percent, and and totally, he, he he just felt that this that for him it was like a re experience of being groomed, and uh, and he just thought that nobody's that nice. Everybody has a point, every, you know, and I can't see her point, and I just feel terrified and vulnerable. And he, 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 he wouldn't, he wouldn't work with this person um, at all. Um, and then there was obviously there's the, the the fear that happens is that if somebody's nice, they're going to get exploited in these types of forensic environments, or you know, their kindness will be taken for weakness. And of course, there is some of that that. Um, People don't know how to sometimes receive care, and so I'll, I'll, I'll just take as much as I can because I don't know when it's going to stop. Um, and then there would be a sort of, but the, the member staff would sometimes get burnt out because they would give too much. Um, so I suppose there's risks attached to both that controller side that I found from the research, and that you get into these power control traps that just comes tighter and tighter and less emotionally connected. And then the pacifier side is that. And we should give too much to the point that it's either too overwhelming for the person receiving it or it's too overwhelming for the member staff because there's only so much we can give. We need, we need some boundaries. Do you have a sense of whether certain kinds of staff, whether there were particular characteristics in staff that were associated with whether they took these roles? You know, what was um, I get that people don't, don't sit in these roles all the time mm. in a static way. But did you is is there a sense from your research in terms of what kind of personal characteristics or what kind of vulnerabilities in staff might lead them to be more frequently aligning themselves with one position more than the other? The, the research didn't really focus on that. It was very much about really trying to capture this idea of consistent boundary management and what people were doing. But I think certainly there's a natural. We all have a natural preference. To either sit to the more con- the controller side or the caring side, so there's certainly that's from the the training etc. I've done. Everybody can naturally position themselves as one side of the seesaw or others, and and I suppose there there could be from just listening to those conversations that I've had over the years. You know, I think family history has probably got a big part of it. Um, and the sort of narrative that you were given about boundaries as you go up. Also, I think the narrative of the institutions will have quite a role because people may not naturally sit to maybe a controller side, but that's certainly a more dominant narrative than forensics, so it's safer to be on that side at some level if you think you're going to fit in. Um, but I, I think it's, I suppose we all have our own boundary narratives, don't we, that we bring to every situation and, and they they come, they're, they're, they're social, they're personal, they're familial. Um, all those things will be influencing how we think boundaries work. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dave, I realise I've um, stayed in half yeah, of your questions. Well, good job I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so... I can see you're looking puzzled. <laughs> oh, I, I, just want, the boundary. Oh, <laughs> I just want to branch off slightly because I was just at a conference, a community of communities conference, which was for therapeutic communities. And uh, the chairman introduced the day, which was focused around transitions, with I thought quite a an interesting set of ideas. What he would, what he was saying really that. We're all in this kind of state of balance, so we feel more comfortable when 
we know things are set and containing and yet we're in a constant state of interaction with the world which means that we have to change we're continually in this state of change and it seems to me that this is right where your identification of the issues around boundaries lies do you would you agree with that yeah well it sort of fits into my later thinking around boundaries is, which connects into complex systems theory which is this idea that we um boundaries are critical to our sense of well-being but they're not real or fixed they are at best a, a, a self-organizing structure that we use in a moment in time to give us some sense of order and stability but they're always changing and we're always sitting at the edge of anxiety so um so i think boundaries that they are a scaffolding in which we self-organize our world around but none of those are real they are cognitive abstractions. there are judgment about how things work at this moment in time and what we know from complex systems theory in relation to boundaries is that that when we self-organize in a particular way and have our boundaries in a particular way that if somebody outside us pushes on those then those boundaries will stay strong but they're very sensitive to internal changes so our internal processes can change our boundaries really rapidly whereas quite strong forces outside will do nothing to those boundaries they'll stay quite fixed and that links into the idea about that I was saying earlier about relational boundaries I think we think about boundaries only being between people but it the links is I think it's frenzies is the original idea this idea of inner and outer boundaries so relational boundaries, there's an outer quality and an inner quality. And it's this inner quality that's very vulnerable and sensitive to change, which will complete, completely almost upscale the whole way we self-organise. Can you give us a, an example of, of what you mean to illustrate that? Inner and outer boundaries or...? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I suppose inner, inner boundaries are, are our attitudes. So, for example, um, we may have some negative thoughts about somebody that we're working with and we really might think inwardly that we don't really like them um, uh, but you would professionally you would be trying to manage that and then your outer boundaries you should be hopefully managing in a professional and appropriate in the way in the same way you would manage anyone so it's this idea of these inner boundaries are almost like our attitudes our values and um, and what we know when, when boundary violations happen is that somebody's inner boundaries are often violated long before you'll see an outer boundary violation. So we have to change how we think about the person in our mind before we actually get any um, change in the relating behaviour. Hmm. Uh, it's all very fascinating. When, when, when I um, used to do lots of one-to-one work when I was practicing as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist um, uh, we obviously we thought a lot about boundaries and as you point out in some of your papers we I suppose use the terms transference and counter transference to kind of broadly describe uh, the kind of interactions that we thought took place between individuals and I always imagined or I always thought to myself that the the work really only began to take place when we were both feeling at the sort of edge of our boundaries um, and then as you so ably describe you know having this kind of flexible uh, boundaries both creative but also rather dangerous because it, it, it can go wrong do you know what I mean uh, there's a lot in that there, isn't there? So there's uh, the idea of this um, this co-creation of a space, isn't there, between you and another. And I suppose that's uh, something quite unique to that therapeutic relationship and, and hopefully quite transformative for all those involved. But I suppose, I think, um, in holding a boundary... And that might be your boundary. That can also be as important for change. 
as well as the co-creative space, if that makes sense. Because some of our those people I've worked with, you know, they haven't really had boundaries. I think one of the residents that I worked with some years ago, he said, um, you were always I always did things to make you inconsistent. It didn't work. That was the first time that I had stability in my life or something like that. So there's there's so there's something about that flexibility of co-creation with the same space together. But then there's also sometimes that capacity to hold on to a boundary and say the, the, the answer is no and it's always going to be no in this situation. Um, which which reminds me of the way that children, are uh, when children push at boundaries, but actually children don't want to get their own way. Or they, they might think they do, mm. but children don't want to get their own way all the time and it doesn't make them feel safe. And I think... You know, given the troubled histories of many people who find themselves in forensic institutions, mm -hmm. having an experience of boundaries and authority mm -hmm. figures that are safe and actually genuinely mm -hmm. protecting them and and offering stability is so important, isn't it? Yeah, and it's that there was some there's a paper by McLean some years ago. It was called a benign authority, and uh, and then there's another version which is a benevolent dictator, but it's that sort of idea is that that we have to be benign authorities. And that really think, links into that third rule on the boundary seesaw of the negotiator is that there's some fixed boundaries, but they're not just, often those fixed boundaries, they're, you apply those in your relationships more generally. So whether that's with patients or staff or family or friends, they're, they're values for you about how you think the world works for you at least. And they're your sort of fixed boundaries, your non-negotiables, but everything else you would negotiate around. And, and and often residents will patients will push against those non negotiables to see if I think I think um I think this capture this image captures it really well. I, I remember um, a patient he said to me, Laura, sometimes I just have to lean up against the walls of the room just to make sure that they're still there. And <laughs> and that just sort of captures that idea, I think, for me. That's a great metaphor. Yeah. Though, of course, I think your your writings and your research allude in the same way that our understanding of physics now alludes that actually the walls aren't really there. Um, there's, there's more space than there is matter, and we're not even sure what matter is. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to avoid going down that wormhole, because when I was writing that philosophical paper, I end up reading stuff about matter and, and what is a surface and um, that, I don't think that's a good place to go again. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you started me thinking about that when I was reading one of your papers because you used this um, term mm. fiat, which I kept reading as flat because of the mm. font and the... Uh, and the, obviously the quality of the printer as well. So I kept reading that, that <laughs> boundaries are flat. And, and I was thinking, well, is she talking about flat universe? <laughs> what is it <laughs> she's referring to? And I suddenly understood by looking very closely um, that it was using this unusual word, uh, fiat. How did you come to start using that particular word? It came from my study of geography and um, boundaries and geography. And um, uh, <laughs> so, this is this is so typical of Laura. But in terms of in terms of studying geography, as randomly as a as a as any psychologist does, <laughs> um, but also I think what what makes for really rich work the fact that you do draw on knowledge from lots of different areas. Yeah, well, there, there was a philosophical paper as well from geography about boundaries and. Uh, you know, why wouldn't we study, if we've got an interest in boundaries, why would you look to geography? Because that's where boundaries are more prevalent. And and they, it was a guy by, called Smith who talked about, who explored this concept of our boundaries real and then uh, fey boundaries. So And um, and then he had this one dynamic fey boundaries. Uh, but it's this idea, he came to the conclusion that boundaries from a geographic perspective weren't real. And... Uh, and I sort of was quite captured by that idea because if you can't define the edge of a mountain, where uh, then how are we ever going to manage and define with any definitive realness about boundaries between people? So 
that got me into this concept of Sabine group and uh, and then I think I, I sort of went with that and then I got there was a Varsi wrote an interesting philosophical paper on boundaries and like the four dimensions of a boundary. So, so far away from flat boundaries, is I believe the boundaries are three dimensional space around us. We all got our own little boundary bubbles that are constantly contracting and expanding as we interact and meet with people. And uh, so, this idea that the boundary at the edge isn't, isn't real, they're blurry and shimmery, and bits are merged and bits, bits are separate. So, um and that links into this idea about ownership, which I think lets into the Northern Ireland stuff as to who owns a boundary and uh, who the heck knows. We own bits of it, don't we? Or we think we do. Mm. Oh, where, where is it? Uh, you got me thinking about Mandelbrot sets now, which appear to be finite items, but actually they've got... Uh, an infinite boundary. <laughs> yeah, and I think I've certainly come to that place. And then I got quite. It, there's a there's a book called The Philosophy of the Flesh because when I was trying to think about well, what is a boundary? What is a relational boundary? And, and I thought, well, your skin, that's clearly the boundary. But then, then I got thinking about that, and even this conversation today, we will have breached each other boundaries because there'll be ideas that we've talked about that will take away. So therefore, you're inside of me inside of another, so therefore the skin isn't the boundary for us as humans. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a multiplicity you very much of voices. For... <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, so getting back to um, the uh, original questions that we've, uh, we had uh, set out, um, I'm not sure if we answered um, the question about what kind of factors influence the position that staff members take and can people tell whereabouts they are on the seesaw they are and maybe this is an opportunity for you to describe your ideas about the uh, boundary the seesaw. I think I sort of described those already a little bit but certainly when you show because the boundary seesaw comes from observing staff's day-to-day -day behaviour when you put it up people automatically connect to it that they can, they, they, you can almost see it happening as they start to plot other team members on it, they start to plot themselves on it. And having done this training many, many times, um, people really connect. They put themselves on it, they can talk about how they move. And what you find is that some people will have very large relating zones where they can do some controller behaviour, negotiator behaviour, pacifier behaviour, where some of the people have very narrow ones and they they don't really move out of the controller much. It's just different levels of control or different levels of pacifying. But yeah, people find it very easy to locate themselves and locate their teams. And actually it creates a really good opportunity for dialogue in teams, I find. Why people sometimes get into conflict with each other. You have your people who are out and out pacifiers and the people who are out and out controllers who butt heads a lot about how to manage a particular situation. And you can just see it. Well, this is where you are in the seesaw. This is a boundary position, but it's not the only one. And then you can start a dialogue around that. Great. Thanks very mm -hmm. much. So having a good understanding of boundaries is particularly pertinent to providing treatment to people with um, complex PTSD. So can you explain why that is? I suppose it really links into that idea that often people who have well, complex trauma, personality disorder, they've often had a series of boundary issues in their life. And, I mean, you could argue that those developmental experiences around those shattering of expected boundaries are linked to the, the form of psychopathology. So, in some ways, the correction, the opportunity for growth will happen around boundaries as well. So, there's something... If, the boundary breaches cause some of the difficulties, then fixing some of the boundary experiences will hopefully fix some of the, that's really poor language, but will fix some of the sort of difficulties that that person has. I haven't articulated that really well, but, but I suppose I see boundaries as critical to, the, to trauma in both why people are traumatised and also their recovery from that. Thank you. And is it 
I think there's a tendency in services to assume that people um, who are at the softer end of the 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 seesaw might be the kind of like the weaker link among the staff group, really? but there is also a a weakness associated with being at the at the opposite end, isn't there? I mean, you know, if you think about physical materials, it's possible for a material to be so so hard that it's brittle and and shatters. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 risks attached to all of the roles, even the negotiator role. So somebody stays in the negotiator too rule too long as they don't make decisions sometimes because sometimes you have to make a decision and live with that in the controller position then as you say about that brittleness and that rigidity and often i remember some some patients saying well i know what i'm going to get so if i push and push and push i know that they'll put me in seclusion so there's almost like you know that that person's rigid you know if you push enough you'll get what you want um and the pacifier rule then again uh, there's that idea the person gives too much that they get burnt out or the patient gets overwhelmed because actually they just want to have a boundary sometimes. Uh, but but there's strengths as well in the, the the pacifier role. They're the people who take the therapeutic risks. They're the people who will try something different and believe in the person and take the therapeutic risks and that can really shift the dynamic. And, you know, in terms of the control of the position, the person feels safe. I don't particularly like the level of control, but at least I know exactly where I stand. And actually, I've never had that sense of stability before. So I suppose there's strengths and weaknesses in, in all the roles. And a good team will have a balance of controllers, pacifiers and negotiators. Thank you. And how can people improve their ability to negotiate boundaries with people they're caring for? How can we do a better job of it? I suppose there's... Um, first of all, there's a willingness to step into the relationship. So there's sometimes that people will just go through the motions and, and actually not even get into the messiness that is human relationships. So a willingness to step onto the seesaw. And also there's an, an acknowledgement that we're constantly moving. And I suppose it's how do we take a step back to reflect on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but it's not, so, it's not just the individual. It's, it's also teams. If we're working in teams, we have responsibility to look out for each other ask each other questions but also organizations taking that responsibility to give people space whether that's through supervision through um creating a culture where it's okay to talk about boundary issues as not being these black and white right and wrong things that we're we all make boundary mistakes doesn't matter how much training you give people we make them that's human let's think about it let's work it out together so um there's a space of openness and curiosity and creating environments that allow that to happen. Sounds, as you're talking, it, it sounds as if it's a mistake to think about boundaries just, you know, just at the individual level because so much of it seems to be about having a balance within within the whole team and that recognition that people do fluctuate, but using boundaries as a way of reading the healthiness of the team um, and how much of a mix there might be. Um, so whether the, the whole team, for the most part, is falling down at one end or whether there's a degree of balance across the, the whole team. Yeah, and it's also as a manager that you have to play devil's advocate. So even if your natural position is where the majority is in the team, to balance the seesaw, then you've got to go and put your weight on the other side. And often in, in team discussions, if everybody's arguing for a sort of a more advocating position, then good balanced decisions in terms of dialectical philosophy. If that's the thesis, what is the antithesis? And a good healthy team should be bringing the antithesis and the thesis to get a good synthesis of a decision. So often it's about playing devil's advocate and stepping aside to make sure we have balance in our decision making. Do you think in forensic systems that some professional groups face more challenges to their boundaries than other, or more they encounter more challenges around boundaries than than others, or is it just that the work's different? I think it's the work's different, and I think you have uh, different types of boundary challenges. So you can think about some of the nurses; their their boundaries are being pressed against all the time, and. And then they're making those balance, those decisions between sometimes having to restrain somebody and then they'll be providing like 
uh, nursing care and compassionate care to somebody almost within the space of an hour. You know, so there's as therapists, particularly if you're working long term with somebody, then there's a, a different type of boundary challenge of familiarity and that deeper relationship and that deep, deeper bond and how do you help that person make sense of the closeness that happens and the warmth and the love that somebody can experience in that relationship, but actually that that relationship still stays professional. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's quite a complex um, boundary relationship to talk about. So I think there's, there's different challenges, um, but boundaries are everywhere. And we're all facing these boundary challenges. Yeah, it was, I suppose it was also really interesting to hear you use the word love within the context mm. of boundary relationships. Mm. Because I think forensic services become very frightened of, of that word and find it hard to believe that there can be love in a boundary way within therapeutic relationships. Mm. Well, I suppose for me, um, I just I think of Marshall Linehan's 10 primary emotions. Love is one of them. So why wouldn't that be present if that we think all the other emotions are present in different sorts of ways? Of course it would be. And um, love is a natural human emotion of connectedness. It doesn't have to be sexual, which I think often people assume it is. And uh, it's actually one of the most d- difficult emotions I find that forensic service users to talk about as well, because they, some people not having it or it being very confused. So I think we need to get better at talking about emotions across the board in forensics, not just anger and fear, but actually the whole broad... We're getting... this think shame is becoming more um, commonly spoke about with Paul Gilbert's work in Compassion, but and guilt's obviously been around in the criminal sort of sense, but you know, there's the whole ten emotions there, and for somebody to have a... Um, I, I, I suppose that... I'm trying to think of a word, but it's, um, I suppose, the whole repertoire of emotions that somebody needs to have some understanding of because they will be impacting their lives. So we need to be talking about love like we would talk about anything else. It gets dysregulated, like all emotions. Yes, yeah, indeed. I was thinking about an article I was reading earlier on today about um, an argument between... Clint Eastwood and one of his lovers back in the 80s and how similar it was to the battle that's been going on with um, Depp and uh, Amber Hearst and how amazingly, horribly toxic that has become and how it's all got caught up in misogyny and all kinds of other nasty boundary breaking stuff but anyway that's just me I just found myself thinking about that (laughs) whilst you were talking Um, but um, thinking about outside of forensic organisations which are the ones that you've mainly worked in and researched do you think um, managing boundaries can have implications for healthy organisations generally or to make organisations more healthy? For me, I suppose I I feel a lot of things through a, a boundary lens and, and I think there's something about assessing your organisation and where it's at. So often, historically, we would have, in teams or in units, we'd have said, well, where's our unit today? Where are we on the seesaw model? And why have we got there? And then using that as a reflection tool in a month's time where are we and how's that changing so there's something about reflecting on your boundary management style as an organization that can um and doing that over time can give you a good indication of how healthy or unhealthy or why it's changing in particular directions and and do you want the organization to go in that way or is it being driven in that way from some other dynamics yeah so, and also, given your wide knowledge and experience now, based upon your research, are there any tips that you might give to people about how to manage boundaries better in their life? I'm not sure I can do that. I think it's, uh, 
that would I, I'm not a boundary expert, um, and I think that we all are experts in our own boundary process. And I think it's um, it is about staying curious. And I think I'd say is don't always see boundaries as points of separation. They can also be points of connection. And actually, when we irritate each other's boundaries, sometimes that's when um, relationships become much more stronger and deeper. Thank you. Uh, that's a very helpful answer. So looking back on, on, your, on your own life, knowing what you do now, mm. do you think there are any areas that you might have managed boundaries differently for yourself? Yeah, loads. <laughs> probably just yesterday there was probably something. Um, I think uh, getting boundaries wrong is part of life. And... Um, I look forward sometimes to getting boundaries wrong because actually that's when new things, exciting things happen. So do you think it's an intrinsic part of learning and development then? Yeah, it's, it's what we do when we get it wrong. Uh, the reality is we will get it wrong. No amount of training will ever stop us getting boundaries wrong. So I suppose it's about severity, of course, isn't it? But the reality is we... We irritate each other's boundaries all the time. That's a form of getting it wrong. It's what we do when we get it wrong and how we make those repairs. Because actually that's what is really transformative often when you're working with clients. When you get it wrong, I need to have that conversation about, you know what, I could have said that better. I could have managed that better. Yeah, very well put. So again, yeah. focusing on you, because you've worked for many years now in these quite challenging uh, forensic settings but you've got a really healthy outlook so how, how do you manage to protect your own positivity and well-being I, I was thinking about this um, and um, I remember an old supervisor described this concept of islands of sanity and um, and I think I've taken that away with me is that I always try to have islands of sanity wherever I work and I was wondering about what because it's my island of sanity it's probably somebody else's island of insanity it's very specific but but I think I in those islands of sanity I tend to have people around me who tend to focus on looking for the light so um, trying to always see the goodness in people so when I lose that sense of seeing the goodness in people, there's always enough people around to help me refocus my mind. Yeah, thanks really very much indeed. Mm. Naomi, do you have any final thoughts? No, I've just really enjoyed that conversation and just also thinking of all these other things that I'd quite happily spend the afternoon chatting with Laura <laughs> about. So definitely feeling we need to get you back on to discuss some of these other areas of of interest. Yeah, that was really great talking with you, Laura. Little anxiety provoking, it's the first time I've ever done a podcast. <laughs> you were really good, really nice, yeah. really nice um, responses to, yeah. to questions. And we did kind of like deviate from the, from the, from the questions and you managed, just managed that in your stride. <laughs>